promoting of ecological knowledge, canine behavior, and ecology. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you all this morning. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk about here was sort of the, <clears throat> the idea, and let me have the next slide. I, I, this is just my illustration of the next slide. Correspondence between a few of our more important species. But one of the things that seems to have been characteristic of the settling of North America is as people from Europe or European ancestry encountered indigenous peoples, they talked to each other, but there was a tendency to ignore or dismiss much of the knowledge and uh, sort of accounts of things that were given by the indigenous people. And so that they tended to be denigrated and ignored, particularly with regard to being recognized as a scientific tradition as such. But one of the things that a lot of people didn't realize, and, and I don't really know if people are really picking up on it even today, is that there was a coding of a lot of these knowledge and the stories, but the, because these stories tended to have what people from the Western tradition view as fanciful aspects, they tended to uh, classify them as mysticism or legend, which unfortunately have become slightly pejorative terms in our society and have sort of become dismissive, even though that they characterize a great deal of fairly detailed information. So, next slide. Okay, so one of the things that is kind of ironic about this is that there's one <coughs> group of Native American uh, scholars, academics, that have asserted, sort of at least made some attempts to address this issue, and that is that people working within the fields of literature and other arts have been the primary venues through which the indigenous peoples of the Americas could express their traditional values and philosophy and have them taken seriously by a uh, sort of the society as a as whole. And the example here in this painting is by Martha Littlechief, who's a Kiowa Comanche artist that is called Old Friends, that I think illustrates a, a position that most people who consider or think about Indians of the Plains would not recognize. Thank you. All right, excuse me, next slide. Okay, so that especially with regard to the people working in literature, and this has become more and more developed over recent years, is that there's one category of literature that is fairly well known in the European tradition, which is called the philosophical novel. And this has been defined by philosophers as the subspecies of fiction which endeavors to present a specific philosophical viewpoint. And sometimes there'll be metaphysical, sometimes ethical, and sometimes aesthetic elements to this as well. And although in most cases it's considered a defect in a work of fiction to ally itself with a particular point of view, for a philosophical novel, this is really an important aspect. The particular worldview is being embodied, and that's one of the preconditions of actually trying to understand what the, the author is trying to tell you. Next slide. So here, here's a couple of examples from Canadian writers that, that I want you guys to think about. This is from Beth Brandt, who's a Mohawk. So we've been forced to reject and forget which makes us real as native peoples. The dominant society longs for this forgetfulness on our part, hungering for our, assim our assimilation into their world, their beliefs, their code. But we may have forgotten remains in our blood. And then she lists a group of, of non-humans here, the, the salmon, the blue heron. Uh, the, the, these organisms are still part of what makes indigenous people when, when she then says is a big part of what makes her indigenous, and that a lot of people really have not forgotten despite attempts at assimilation and acculturation. Next slide. And this is one of my favorites, actually. This is from uh, Ruby, Ruby Slipperjack, who's a Fort Hope Ojibwe. And this is a quote from one of her novels that just, uh, she, has, she has two uh, native people talking. And one said, I could hear a loon calling, another loon answered, and soon they were carrying on like two old friends. I looked at old Jim and asked, why do people say the lonely call of a loon or the eerie hoot of an owl when I've never heard these things by themselves? There's always two or a whole bunch of them. Old Jim chuckled and said, well, when you don't understand a language, all the voices sound the same, don't they? <laughs> well, the irony is, is this even permeates Western scientific traditions, is that we tend to work these cultural metaphors into the way we think about things. Next slide. 
So the person I want to sort of focus on a bit is Lewis Owens, the late Lewis Owens, who was a Choctaw, Cherokee, Irish mixed blood, who was the author of five novels, two books of essays, and two major works of literary criticism. And one of the things that, was the, that I thought was the best about Lewis was that he managed to work the spiritual traditions of knowledge of the natural world into his novels probably as well or better than practically any other Native American writer. Next slide. All right, in particular, with regard to the sort of the theme of my talk, I want to refer to his two bookend novels. His first published novel, Wolf Song, which was published in 1991, and Dark River, which was, I think, published in 2000 or 2001. And these, in both of these uh, wolves were, or the, the, the image of a wolf were important characters. Next slide. So, in, particularly in the, his first novel, Wolf Song, Lewis employed the gray wolf as a sort of a metaphor to represent the story of a young Salish man returning to his tribe from college and trying to reestablish his links with these cultural traditions in the natural world. And one of the things that happened particularly to this young man throughout the novel is he's always being accompanied by ravens and guided by the ravens as he seeks his way back to these traditions. And one thing that Lewis knew really well, because he and I had actually talked about this, was that ravens and gray wolves are actually close companions of each other in nature quite often. And so by following the wolves, and, and, and particularly the message of wolves returning to the North Cascades in the same way that this young man was returning to the North Cascades, both cases, both him and the wolves sort of moving into areas from which they've been displaced and to which they were now returning, uh, so in, his, in this case, the gray wolf became sort of a, a metaphor for increased sociality, increased connectedness, and increasing links to nature. Now the next slide. So by, uh, by his last novel, Lewis was sort of working a different theme. And as a Choctaw, this was really interesting. In, Red, in Dark River, his main character is a Choctaw named Jacob Neshoba. And Neshoba is the Choctaw world word for the Red Wolf. And Jacob was a Vietnam veteran who had been completely alienated from his own people and just felt completely culturally displaced. And he was working as a wildlife officer for the White Mountain Apache in Arizona. And in this case, Neshoba is really interesting because what he would, again, this time he was working the idea of the wolf character as a loner. And what was really interesting about this, and Lewis is drawing upon information from his elders who are Choctaw, is that it was not widely known, and still is not widely known in American society, in American science, that Canis Rufus is actually not a wolf as such, but a, but a, a large form of coyote, and is very solitary, and has been, it, it's now officially extinct in the wild, and it's basically been displaced from all of its land. So again, you see that Lewis was doing two things. One is he was coding the, uh, the experience of the indigenous person, but at the same time, he was using the, the sort of natural history and ecology of the particular canid species as a, a metaphor, and in this case, very literally, with, by giving the character the name of the red wolf as his own name. Next slide. So what I want to sort of wrap up with here as I talked a little bit about wolves, it's a shame the bottom of that didn't quite show up. But I want to refer to another well-known native writer, Louise Erdrich, who is an Anishinaabe. And what's interesting here is that this is one of the one of the things Louise does periodically. She takes real incidents and includes them as, as a portion of her writing. And this was a description that she made, uh, that, that she drew upon, that was made by a missionary of one of the last buffalo hunts on the Northern Plains. And, and apparently what happened during this situation was a, a number of buffalo were killed, but the other buffalo around them in the group refused to leave. So the, the narration here is in the wake of this hunt, the herd would not bolt away, but behaved in a chilling fashion. The surviving buffalo milled at the outside of the carnage, not grazing, but watching with insane intensity. Even through the night, the buffalo stayed and were seen by the uneasy hunters and their family to remain standing quietly as though mourning their young and their dead, all their relatives that lay before them. And I'm, just, I'm editing this. The original is much stronger and harder to read. At the sun's zenith, the buffalo began to make a sound. 
It was a sound never heard before. No buffalo had ever made this sound. An unmistakable and violent grief. It was as though the earth itself was sobbing. The buffalo were taking leave of the earth and, and all they loved, said the old chiefs and hunters. The buffalo went crazy with grief to see the end of things. Like us, they saw the end of things, and like many of us, they chose not to live on, which is the part that's cut off at the bottom. But what's interesting here, and, and I, I find really compelling about this, is this is a, a, an actual account of something that happened, but it's an account of an event that Western science would have a great deal of difficulty dealing with. Uh, the, the recognition of emotion and emotional responses on the part of non-humans, and especially in basically the, the sense that you know, as, as a one-time event, this would be regarded as an anecdote in Western science, not as a something unique and powerful that needed to be regarded as a significant story. So, next slide. With that, thank you all very much. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I'm on the Animal Care Committee at my university. I can guarantee you it still exists in most cell and molecular biologists. Because I don't think they could do what they do if they didn't have a whole, essentially use a Cartesian worldview as their, as their ultimate philosophical justification. Whether or not they would actually admit to this if you asked them point blank, I don't know. But it's very clear from watching their discussions that they regard some of the, the, you know, especially the rats and mice they work with as if they were completely disposable and uh, sort of unimportant entities. They're simply numbers. There's a um, popular theory in Amazon technology these days called perspectivism. I don't know if you've looked into that at all. No, I haven't. But, but it has the idea of linking the way animals are perceived with an indigenous thought to the way human uh, behavior is enacted. So the concept here is that people, uh, jaguars look at blood the way humans look at deer, let's say, right <laughs> now. These analogies are set up. And also, there's a, 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 a shape-shifting that can go on through shamanism, wherein an uh, individual can become, say, a jaguar or a wolf. Well, that, that definitely happens in, in the second book by Lewis, the, the, the Dark River. There is a shape-shifting character in that book. Yeah, so I, I think that's, uh, right. and, you know, just an interesting comparison. It's a popular theory. Well, I, 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 I think things, things like that are that really idea of shamanism and shape-shifting. Oh, I think things like that are really important. But what I particularly wanted to emphasize here is how actual ecological knowledge that, that actually in some ways anticipates things that Western science has yet to discover or is just discovering can be found encoded in a lot of these native writings. Thank you. Thank you very much.